the praise of the Lord, everybody, and shalom. Peace be unto you. Aleichem shalom. Aleichem shalom. Amen. I'm not turning Jewish, but Josiah is evidently. Amen. Let's go over our Bibles tonight in the book of Acts. And I'm going to pick up here in the 13th chapter. And we're going to pick up in the 44th verse. It's going to be a little odd tonight, so just, just stick with me. Jonathan, I'll tell you what, while I'm going over here, you go get me Acts, the fourth chapter, and hold on to that. Uh, Josiah, get me Acts, the thirteenth chapter. Okay. Let's pick up here. Um, yeah, 44th verse. And the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing ye put it from, your, from you, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles." For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of God. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region. But the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women, and the chief men of the city, and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas, and expelled them out of their coasts. But they shook off the dust of their feet against them, and came to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. We read that. How often do you actually think about Paul and Barnabas? And later on, Paul and Silas. Do you ever really put any thought about who you're reading about? These men are going out, they're preaching, and we think, well, that's their job. I mean, that's what God called them to do. They're, they're going out, and they're, they're preaching, they're doing their job. But I got to, let's just put a little something extra with this. Barnabas, give me Acts, the fourth chapter, give me 31 through 37. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. And with great power he gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold, and laid them down at the apostles' feet, and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. And they certainly by Joseph, close enough, it's Joseph, that's the Greek form of Joseph, okay. who by the apostles was a surname Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite, Son of encouragement is how we would say it. Go ahead. A Levite. And of the country of Cy Cyprus, having land, sold it, and brought the money, and laid it at the apostles' feet. Okay, so Barnabas here. We're, we're going to talk about Barnabas, Barnabas for a minute. There are those that look back in history and believe that Barnabas was possibly the rich young ruler that came up to Christ and walked away because Jesus rebuked him not really rebuked him, but said pretty much give it all up and follow me. And they believed later along, he came along and he did just that. But they believed that Barnabas was the rich young ruler. Now you can have whatever feelings you want to about it honestly, but think about this. The man had enough property to go out and sell and he brought it in and he laid it at the apostles' feet. And he was always in a good mood. He, he was the son of consolation. He was the son of encouragement. That's what the apostles called him. At a time when they were going around trying to strengthen and encourage the brethren, he was encouraging everybody. But this man, he wasn't a man of no means. He wasn't some bum off the street. 
This man had something to give to God. And he gave it all up. And he was out there preaching before the Apostle Paul. Because he was the one that felt too busy in Antioch to be able to handle it all. And then he went to Tarsus and got Saul after Saul had been converted and brought him back to Antioch. The man was not some poor fellow that had nothing to lose. But everything that he did have, he laid down yes. to go preach the gospel. Amen. Go over and get me Acts, the 23rd chapter. Now, Paul, we, we think a lot about Paul. They've made movies. They've made all kinds of movies about Paul, but you hardly ever hear anything about Barnabas. But uh, go over and get me Acts, the 13th chapter, and I just want the first verse, 23, Acts 23, and I'll give the rest of it here shortly. Go ahead. Yeah. Now, there were in the church that was at Antioch okay. certain prophets and teachers. Perk up your ears and listen to this. As Barnabas and Simeon, that was called Niger, uh -huh. and Lucius of Cyrene, and Menaean, which had been brought up both with Herod the Tetrarch and yeah. Saul. Which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. Saul evidently went to school at the same place as Herod the Tetrarch that was a king. Paul wasn't some poor little tent maker. Paul wasn't somebody that had nothing to, hey, Lord, here I am, I've got nothing. I, I can say that to God. God send me, I've got nothing to lose. But these men had something to lose. But what Saul says, or Paul says over in the book of Philippians, he goes on and he brags a little bit about himself. He says, I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. I was a Pharisee. I was a Pharisee of Pharisees. But I counted it all dumb to gain the riches that are in Christ. These men gave it all away. They pushed it all away. We think, well, my goodness, couldn't they use that wealth to go preach the gospel? But Paul's out there in Corinthians as he's saying, these hands have met my need. I have gone out, I have worked in the daytime, I have preached at night because you're not going to take my glory from me. Yeah, they gave away their wealth. They gave away their pedigree. They gave away everything that was behind them. They went bye-bye to mom and dad who were probably still devout Jews and didn't want to have anything to do with their wayward children. They cast it all off and they started walking for Christ. And they didn't go out looking for riches. They weren't going out charging people for money, out preaching or anything like that. They weren't trying to get people to stir it up to be anything in this world. They were trying to drag as many souls into the next one as Amen. they possibly could. Amen. The book of Jude talks about how we're supposed to be pulling these souls out of the fire, hating the garment spotted by the flesh. Let's back up a little bit with Paul here. I, I want, no, I'm sorry, I gave it to you. Acts 23, just give me verses 23 and 24. Joe, go get me John, 10th chapter. Acts 23, verses 23 and 24. And listen to this, and I want you to think about this. Think about Paul. Think about the times. Think about the soldiers they had there. And this is who Paul was. And he called unto him two centurions, saying, Make ready two hundred soldiers to go to Caesarea, and horsemen threescore and ten, and spearmen two hundred, at the third hour of the night. And provide them beasts that they may let Paul on and bring him safe unto Felix the governor. I want you to understand at this time that we are talking about, Jews were thought so little of that they would have been crucified here and there just leading up. It's a pleasure to scare the living daylights out of you while you're going up to the gates of Jerusalem. But Paul was thought so important by this man, by this magistrate, that he sends a small army with him to make sure nothing happens to him. Why? Maybe because he came up with Saul, or uh, Herod. Maybe because he came up with Herod. But this is the life Saul left behind. It was cushy. I mean, he would have been running, he would have been one of those people Jesus was talking about. Be not called rabbi. People have been rabbi, rabbi, just loving him for all of his knowledge. Yeah. And instead he goes out and he is stoned. Yes. 
and he is wet. They take him out. They throw him in prison. He and Silas were laying there. They had been beaten, probably all bloody and everything else. And what do they do? Oh, I can't believe I left my cushy life for this mess. No, that's not at all what happened. That's not. They, it says literally they started praising God and singing songs. Amen. Can you imagine that? I don't know that I would have that kind of attitude. The apostles, when they were beaten, now they were just fishermen. I mean, they had a couple important ones out there. But it says that they were rejoicing that they were thought worthy to suffer shame of Christ. Yes. Amen. Yes. Amen. And what yes. kind of attitude do we have today? Yes. What kind of attitude do we have today? We are so busy trying to keep up with that world out there. We are so busy trying to look just like they look. Have the car just like they have. Have the house just like they have. Is that what Jesus really came to purchase for us? No. Is that it? Paul said in 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, he said, if in this life only we have hope in Christ Jesus, we are of all men most miserable. Because while the church is looking for their reward here on earth, and they're looking for those that are crying out in the marketplaces, Reverend, Reverend! That's not what he has for us. That which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination with God. I say that goes with a lot of the people too. There's a man right now that used to be apostolic. And I say used to be. T.D. Jakes. But he went out and he pretty much sold his soul to the devil for fame and fortune. And he's got this huge church. What's worse is even a West Virginian. I just don't see how a West Virginian could do such a thing. But Maybe I'm a little biased. I don't know. But he went out. He had the doctrine. He would baptize in the name of Jesus Christ. He was one God apostolic. But just a little bit of that fame, a little bit of that wealth, a little bit of what the world had to offer him. And here's your 30 pieces of silver, Judas. That's not what God's looking for. People don't get it. Our hope is not on this earth. Our hope is not on this earth. Do you have to live in a shoebox like we do? No, I don't know why we're there. I, I really, I, I don't. I don't know why we're there. I don't know why we're here. I had a real good conversation with God earlier today. I, I don't understand a lot of the things that go on. But I do know this earth is not it. Mm -hmm. Josiah, you touched me Thursday night. You didn't get it when I preached it to you, and I sure wish you would have, then I could have patted myself on the back. But when you got to Revelation, you understood that the bride of Christ is responsible for bearing children yes. to the bridegroom. Yes. That's why we're here. Amen. That's why we're here. And I preached it to you and preached it to you, and then who knows? <laughs> God gave the increase. Yeah, I gave somebody John 10. I want verse 10. The thief cometh not, but for to steal, and to kill, and uh, to destroy. Yes. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. There are so many places we could have gone tonight, that there are so many different scriptures I could have gone to, because that fits in. 1 Corinthians, where the Apostle Paul is writing there, talking about how the foolishness of God is wiser than the wisdom of men. But everything that is of God is foolishness to men. To this carnal mind, it is foolishness. They can't understand. And when Jesus came and He said, I came that you might have life, and not just have life, but have it more abundantly, Amen. then our carnal mind instantly says, God wants me to have the Ferrari. No. God wants me to have the mansion. No. But that's what the carnal mind says. And you know what? There's plenty of con artists that are out there that are willing to say, you know what, brother? Sow that seed. You send me a hundred dollars. I don't give you a million. <laughs> yeah, hey, I could be on TV. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, they go out there. And, and that's the kind of foolishness because it makes sense to the carnal mind. Yeah. But that's not what Jesus was talking about. Right, amen. Half the people that Jesus was talking to were put to death in all kinds of Terrible ways. Amen. Amen. Terrible. Is that the abundant life? 
Well, no. No. That's the life we have on this earth. Yeah. And sometimes it stinks. But the retirement benefits. Amen. Amen. The retirement benefits are out of this world. Amen. I mean, you don't have to worry about a 401k or anything else. I mean, the streets of that city are made of yes. pure gold. You don't have to worry about that 401k. You know what? Uncle Sam can't tax it either. So, you know, when, when the time comes up and it's time for me to go, I'm ready to go get my retirement. Yes. And I'm not leaving anything other than my family behind that I really care about. Amen. Because this world is not my own. And you know what this world is going to be to you if you make this world your own? This world is going to be to you misery. Yes. Amen. Because this world picks and chooses. This world decides this one succeeds because they have the right last name. Or this one's not going to succeed because of what their father did. This the nation used to be a place where you could come to and you could make it, but that is long since past. Now if you do the wrong thing, if you do the right thing, if you've got the right friends, as they always said when I was growing up, it's not what you know, it's who you know. Amen. But you know what? Jesus says, come unto me. Yes. And he said that to the beggar yes. just as much as he said it to the rich young ruler. He would, you know what? If Herod would have came down off that throne and repented, Jesus would have saved him. Because when he says, come unto me, he's speaking to everybody. He's speaking to everybody. But just like Paul and just like Barnabas, you've got to give up who you are in this world to come to him. I still, I've said this before, but I guess it's probably been a while. The state of Tennessee, do you know you cannot run for public office if you are a pastor or a preacher? If you're an ordained minister, you cannot run for office in Tennessee. And it's not because they have something against ministers. It's because years ago when they wrote their constitution, they said, you've got the better work. But you have to give up this world. You, you have to give up what this yes. world considers honor. You give up what this world considers wealth. You give it up and you push it behind you. And you go on for Jesus Christ. You go on for Christ. That is what he's called us to do. Let's go to Matthew, the sixth chapter. Spare me the pride. Whose turn is it to read next? Who, who was I throwing the last one to? Yours? Spare me the pride. Go over and get me Hebrews 11 and 6. Yes, that's why I said spare me the pride. And don't look at the wall either. That's cheating. We decided when we first came here, I mean, we weren't going to put all kinds of decorations up and all this other stuff, but we like to decorate with Scripture. So when I'm telling him don't look at the wall, I'm saying don't look at the scripture on the wall. Because this is one of my favorite scriptures. But over in the book of Matthew, the 6th chapter, I'm going to pick up the 19th verse. Jesus is telling the disciples here, he says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. If you are busy in this world, if everything you do in this world is to get one foot in front of the other or climb the corporate ladder or whatever you're doing, you're missing what Jesus said. You have to have a job, okay? You've got to make money. I'm not arguing that point tonight. I'm saying if you're making this world your home, if you're out there working every ounce of overtime you can get while your kids are home with your wife, or while your wife's working and your kids are in daycare, you are missing the point. And you know where they're going to end up? They're going to end up backslidden. They're going to end up on drugs. They're going to end up holding on to this world. They're going to end up on some psychiatrist's couch trying to figure out what on earth happened to them when the fact is that he's God. Yes. Amen. He is the answer yes. to all the misery that is in this world tonight. He is the answer. But people are too busy laying up treasures on this earth. They're not given to God. They're not growing in God. You know what? I'll get closer to God here in a few months. I just got to get this taken care of. That reminds me.
me of the fool. Jesus was talking about this man that had these two barns and everything, and he had so much grain from his harvest. And he says, you know what I'll do? I'll tear down these barns and I'll build bigger. Well, that's an earthly plan. That makes a lot of sense. But you know what the problem is? Thou fool, this night shall that soul be required of thee. Don't give it to the world. Don't give your energy to the world. Don't worry about becoming somebody in this world. You know what? They might have your name down as President so-and-so of some bank. But that paper is going to turn yellow sooner or later and it's going to dissolve. But if your name is in the Lamb's Book yes. of Life, Amen. it can't be taken out. Hallelujah. It can be blotted out if you do something stupid. But if you're walking for God, it can't be taken out. It can't be removed. Amen. They can go up there with an eraser. You know what? There's probably people who like to take me out of that book. But they can try the eraser. They can try the white out. They can try everything they want to do. You can't take my name's there for eternity. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yeah. When I will be walking with my king. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Amen. Amen. I gave you Hebrews 11 and 6. Josiah, give me James 2, verse 5. Yes, sir. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. Okay. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Okay, now, well, let's get this into context. James 2 and 5, you go over and me Mark. 10th chapter. You got it? Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world rich in faith? Hath not God chosen the poor of this world rich in faith? I'll tie it together here in a minute. Go ahead. And heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him. Them streets of gold, amen. Them pearly gates that they always talk about in the bluegrass songs. Mm -hmm. Amen. But I'll tell you what. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. Amen. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. But he has chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith. The thing is, if you have faith and don't have money in this world, you're rich in the other kingdom. Amen. You can be here and you can be just as stinking wealthy as you want to be. You can go do whatever you want to for money. Yeah. And the world will applaud you. Yeah. And then your time is going to come and you're going to lay there and you're going to die and you're going to go straight to hell. Or you can come up and you can trust God. And when you trust God, it's just beginning. Yes. Amen. Amen. Like the Magruders used to sing. I've just started living. Yes. Amen. Amen. The time is coming. The time is coming. I, I gave you Mark 10th chapter. Give me verses 23 through 27. And Jesus looked round about and saith unto his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter in the kingdom of God? Ouch. And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answereth again, and saith unto them, Children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they were astonished out of measure, out of measure. saying among themselves, who then can be saved? And Jesus looking upon them saith, With men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God all things are possible. Okay, now, the tradition that has been passed down that I think is a, a, a bunch of just malarkey is that there was this little gate in Jerusalem in the wall and the camel would get down on his knees and it would have to waddle its way through and it was really difficult to get the camel through. And then when you get the camel on the other side because the gates were shut at night and everything's hunky dory, you're safe. If camels did it all the time, then why were they astonished above measure? I think Jesus was talking about a literal camel and I think Jesus was talking about a literal needle. Why? Because they trust in riches. Yes. They don't trust in 
God. You know what? 2008, there were people that lost everything because they were tied up in the stock market and they were tied up in housing and they were tied up in all this other stuff and they were giving loans to people that couldn't pay them back for houses. I mean, it just all fell apart. There was another time back in the early 1900s, the Great Depression, the banks fell and everybody lost everything. There were people jumping out of windows. And I'm not talking about first story. But they were killing themselves because their hope was in this world. We're in the middle right now of an economic bubble. And it should have popped a long time ago. But they keep hitting that air compressor and they're pumping it up. It's getting bigger and bigger. And they'll patch a hole over here and they'll patch a hole over there. But you know what? It's going to be just like Wall Street back in the early 1900s. There's going to be people committing suicide and everything else. Why? Because their hope was in this world. You got, I, I've got my beans and rice. You guys know about that. But my hopes aren't in my beans and rice if everything falls apart. Yeah. That can be taken away from me. Yeah. But God is offering you something free. Yes. Amen. Free. Absolutely free. He's offering you something free. It can't be taken. It can't be taken away. But how hardly shall those that trust in riches enter into the kingdom of God? It's easier for a camel to enter into the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe, A, that he is, and B, that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Diligently. We lay this stuff aside not hoping for worldly wealth or anything like that. We lay this stuff aside and we push into Christ. I was told right before we moved into this building that we'd have to keep the payments up and we would never be able to keep the payments up. That, that's been a few years ago now. You know what? Well, <laughs> you're right. I couldn't keep the payments up. God did. God shuffled out the money. God, God made it. And I like the way he did it too because we, we kind of left upper, uh, upper poor class and kind of got into lower middle class. But you know what? God blessed us enough to where this is no problem. We're going to go get a bigger building because this place is just too small. But God has blessed us, but we're trusting in Him. Yeah. I'm not trusting in my job. I'm not trusting in man. I'm not trusting in some denomination to come bail me out of my troubles. I'm trusting in my Father. Yes. Amen. That's I'm right. trusting in my Father. Amen. Amen. People who don't understand will say, well, your dad's dead. Well, no. <laughs> My earthly dad, yeah, my earthly dad. But I've got his spirit within me crying out, Abba, yes, Father. Yes. Amen. Amen. In Hebrew, that's daddy. Yes. Amen. He's my daddy. Yes. Amen. Let's go over to Daniel. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, whoever's turn it is, get me 1 Corinthians, the third chapter. I guess it's Joe's because he's flipping pages. Daniel, the fourth chapter. We're going to pick up the 28th verse. And this came upon the king, Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of twelve months, he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. The king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom for by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? How many times had God said, I set you up, Nebuchadnezzar, I put you on that throne, Nebuchadnezzar. I needed to take my belt off and spank Israel, Nebuchadnezzar. That's what you're there for. You didn't do squat, Nebuchadnezzar. But he was lifted up in his pride. He was trusted in his riches. He saw three men thrown in a furnace of fire and come out smiling. And even the smell of smoke hadn't stuck to their clothes. And their clothes were still on them, not ashes back there either. He saw Daniel tell him his dream. He knew God was real. And God had warned him in a dream what was getting ready to happen to him. But he was beating his chest all full of pride. 
See, I can be Tarzan too. I could. I, I wasn't just make a good telepreacher. I could be Tarzan too. But he was lifted up and he was all full of pride. And God had to show him who was boss. While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken. The kingdom is departed from thee. The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Amen. And you know what? At the end of seven years, he was saying, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. <laughs> Amen. He, he had a disease. He, he had something happen to him. His fingernails grew out like bird claws. And he was out there and he was eating grass with the oxen. Yep. And then after the end of seven years, I believe it was, God said, okay, that's enough. And he brought him to. And he went back and he took the kingdom back. He had the kingdom back. But you know what? That arrogance was gone. Yes. yes. Amen. He had the authority again, but he didn't have the arrogance Amen. 1 Corinthians, 3rd chapter, give me verses 1 through 5. Jonathan, give me Colossians, the 2nd chapter. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk, and not with meat, for hitherto ye were not able to bear it. Neither yet now are ye able. That's not 2 Corinthians. That's first Corinthians. That's first Corinthians. Uh, three. Three. Yeah. Chapter 3, 1 through 5. I told you first Corinthians. That's my fault. I wrote Do we begin again to commend ourselves? There we go. Or need we, as some others, epistles of, com of commendation to you? Or letters of commendation from you? Uh -huh. Ye are our epistle written in our hearts. Known and read of all men. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God. The Spirit of the living God. Amen. Not in tables of stone, yes. but in fleshly tables of the heart. And such trust have we through Christ to God's word. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves. Not that, that we are sufficient of ourselves. Amen. Go ahead. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. Our sufficiency is of God. Yes. I, I don't look to Jason to do this. I don't look to Jason to do that. I look to God because He is my sufficiency. Yes. I come to God and I say, God, I, I need this, this, and this. And sometimes I get it and sometimes He says, not yet. Amen. Sometimes it takes faith to take the answer no, too. Yeah. Sometimes we don't understand the answer no. But sometimes it takes faith to take the answer no, too. And you have to say, well, Lord, I'll chalk it up to your will. I don't understand it this time. But you know what? But we've used the illustration before that my wife, who would never get on an airplane, could go into Charlotte and get an airplane, and she could fly to Knoxville, and she sees everything down below her. And it's just like God. God sees everything in our timeline, everything that's going on, every bump in the road. He sees it all. But we're up there in the Pigeon River Gorge. We're going around twisting turns and everything else. We don't know what's on the other side most of the time. But God, the whole time, He knows and He sees. So we have to trust Him when the answer is no because we don't understand the end of the matter. Amen. We don't understand it. Okay, so God's sufficiency. Paul said three times I sought the Lord to take an infirmity away. And the Lord said, My grace is sufficient for thee. Amen. He looked to God. He said, God, I don't understand and I'm sick and tired of this, but... God, okay, your grace is sufficient for me. I'll have to shoulder this burden and go on until you're willing to do something else. But Paul left it in God's hands. He didn't try to take it upon himself. I don't read where he was going out there and chasing after old soothsayers or wizards or witch doctors or anything else. He left it in God's hands. He left it in God's hands. Amen. Colossians, second chapter. Joe, go get me Romans 12. Yes, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. I guess verses would help. Give me 8 through 20. 
Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. Mm -hmm. After the after the tradition of men. After I'm the, sorry, Jonathan. I I don't know what was wrong with me today. That is what I want, but that's not as many verses. I didn't think that sounded right. Okay, uh, give me uh, eight through uh, yeah. Eight through ten. Wow, big difference. Uh, after, the, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Okay. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. For in him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. Ye! Ye! are complete in Him. Yes. Now, we have people in this world that are addicted to money. Mm -hmm. And they will sell their grandmother if they can make a buck. Mm -hmm. And they won't spend it. They'll put it in the bank, save it for later. We have people in this world, and I'm sorry we're, we're all adults here, and we'll get such an 18 or, yeah, 18 month old, but there's people addicted to sex. There was a guy that went out down in Atlanta, Georgia, and they're putting a real smiley face on him when they say it was massage parlors that he went around shooting up. But that's not what I hear it was. It was it, let's just say it was a Parisian house of ill repute. But he was down there and he, he, he shot the masseuses. I guess that's portal for masseuse. But anyways, he was down there and he shot them so he could take care of the temptation I don't think he was tempted to get a massage. I'm sorry. But he was taking care of the temptation and then he left there and he was on the way to Florida so he could knock out some people that were pushing porn. There's people that are addicted to sex and they're just as screwy as the people that are addicted to money and will do anything. There's people out there that are addicted to drugs. We know that. There's people out there that are addicted to alcohol. Yeah. There's people out there that are addicted to fame. I honestly believe Donald Trump was addicted to his own fame. I believe that. I, I believe that. But through all of this, this world is in a miserable place yes. because everybody is looking to be complete. You understand what I'm saying tonight? Everybody is looking for that puzzle piece that will fit in there, that will fill everything up, and oh, that, that's what it is. That's what everybody's looking for that, but Paul gave him the answer almost 2,000 years ago. Right. He said, ye are complete in Him. Amen. In Him. Yes. That's why the world is in the shape it's in. And we're the ones going out trying to tell people, just like you, you like that Paul so much when he went into the synagogue, everybody, I've got good news. <laughs> We can tell them out there, you can be complete in Him. He can yes. take it all away. Amen. You know what? There was a time in my life I had a screw loose. But Jesus tightens loose screws. Amen. When you find your completeness in Him, this world can't do it for you. The things of this world cannot do it for you. Amen. But when you look to Him, when you make yourself complete in Him, it fills it up. It yeah. fills the void. You have something to wake up for tomorrow. And when the time comes that you don't wake up, you got something waiting for you then too. Your every step is ordered by the Lord. Amen. Yes, it is. Because you're complete in Him. The world doesn't understand its misery. It doesn't understand. Tonight, this is Saturday night. We have church on Saturdays. But there's going to be people out there getting loaded. They're trying to forget their problems. They're trying to forget their, their abusive husband, their abusive wife. They're trying to forget the things that's happened to them in life. They're trying to push them all away. But you know what? When that bottle's drained and they woke up hung, hung over in the morning, all those problems that they were trying to get rid of are still there. And you know what? Jesus doesn't take them all away. I've still got memories that will make you nutty. I, 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 I've, I've got memories that will make you nutty. But God makes you able to bear it because yes. you understand 
There's a lot of town. That I, I drive trucks, so you guys know I have all kinds of time to think about all kinds of stuff. And I, I sit there and I think, and I go, oh, if I could build a time machine, I could go back and I could change this, this, and this, and this. But you know what? All the things that I would change are what led me yes. to Jesus. Yes. Amen. All the things that I would go back and change and make better are what made me who I am. Yes. And I'm sorry to use the vernacular, I don't suck anymore. Amen. I'm glad to be who I am. But we have those past things. But you have to come to Christ to square those things up. You come to Christ and you get those things worked out. And then you start walking for Him. And yes, sometimes life is still a bummer. Amen. But you go through with Him. You go on with Him. And you know what? You might be down today, but He'll pick you right back up tomorrow. Amen. Because that's the kind of God He is. He is a rewarder of them that diligently yes. seek Him. Amen. 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 Romans 12, 16. Whoever didn't get that one, get me 1 Timothy 5 and 8. Be of the same mind, one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Mm -hmm. Be not wise in your own conceits. Now, what does all that mean? What does all that mean? Okay, you go out on your job, and there's somebody going to be arguing politics. And you know what? If you came up, puffed up your chest, and said, I'm a Democrat, even though you're not, they'll argue the Republican side. Because there's a lot of people in this world that just like to argue. Yeah, that's true. But we are to condescend to be men of low estate. We shouldn't be concerned about who the president is. We should be concerned about growing the kingdom of God. Amen. We shouldn't be worried about what Congress is doing or what the Senate is doing. Because they proved this last November, your vote doesn't matter anyway. Put it away. Put it aside. Chuck it away, throw it in the bottom of the sea, and work for God. Yes. Amen. Yes. Because I'll tell you what, He's coming back a whole lot sooner than you think. Yes. Mm -hmm. I don't know about me, but I really do believe that you guys probably won't die. Mm -hmm. I believe that. I, I believe that he, He's coming for His church, and I, I don't believe in this church goes whoop, and then all the tribulation gets poured out. We're not appointed under wrath, but tribulation comes through man. Mm -hmm. I believe man is going to be here. The church is going to be here through the tribulation period. And then when the wrath of God, just like what happened back in Sodom and Gomorrah, when the wrath of God is poured out, yes. that's when the church will be taken out. But there's not going to be anything left to save at that point. Amen. It will be, as they used to say, monkey dust. Amen. But we are commanded to do certain things in this world. And when I talk about wealth, when I talk about turning my back on it and not paying attention to it, I'm not talking about our day-to-day -day jobs. I'm talking about these people that will go out and it doesn't matter what's happening to their children. They'll work the overtime. Mm -hmm. And they'll go out and they'll do anything they can for a buck. Because uh, 1 Timothy 5 and 8. But let us who are of the day be sober. That's Thessalonians. That's Thessalonians. I didn't think that sounded right. But the way I, I, I've got a bad record tonight anyway is giving people the wrong scripture. So I was going to let you go. Know. There we go. But if any provide not for his own. Ah, there we go. Now this is a commandment coming down. This is what Paul was setting in order in the church. If any man work not, provide not for his own. And especially for those of his own house, he hath he hath denied the faith, uh -huh. and is worse than an infidel. He has denied. So I'm not up here saying don't have a job. I'm not saying Amen. don't go out and work and provide and make your own way in this world. I'm saying don't get addicted to cash. Yes. Don't get addicted to money. Don't get addicted to the things this world will give you. Don't get addicted to going out and being some big shot on the job or anything else. You go do your job, and you go try to pull them souls from that job into the church. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. But you have to work. Yes. You have to go out. You, you have to make your funds. But uh, kind of like Paul told them over there in Corinthians, as using this world, but not abusing it. Yes. 
and uh, there's a lot of people I think need to find the, the, the happy medium in there. There's a lot of people that have thrown it away. We were talking about that earlier. People that knew God. People that had powerful testimonies. And you know what they've done? Whoosh, flushed it down the toilet. That's what they've done for, for wealth. For what this money, for what this world can give you. They just flushed, a lot of them flushed their kids away. And I mean, honestly, there was a time my wife was working. You guys know this to be true. I mean, there was a time we were falling into the same problem. And I believe if I would have known then what I know now, maybe I could have done things a little bit different. But we don't know about that. We don't know about that. But they flush their kids. They flush their walk with God and everything. And the time's going to come that they're going to stand before that great white throne judgment because they're dead. They're dead. And God's going to throw them into that lake of fire where once upon a time they were a child of God. They threw it all away. Mm -hmm. They threw it all away. Let's go over to 2 Timothy. This is the last scripture. I already see a certain somebody working their way closer to the restroom. 2 Timothy, the second chapter, the third verse. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Now get this in mind. Think about the whole armor of God. Think about what he's saying here. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. Yep. You know what? There's a lot of office politics that go on and everything where I work. Mm -hmm. Which is odd because it's a trucking company. But I was in there and I was talking to the boss and he just knew. He said, well, I know you really don't talk to anybody. I mean, I'm not involved in the gossip. I'm not involved in the, 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 the politics or anything else. I'm not in the middle of all that. Because no man that warreth the warfare that we are warring gets tangled up in that garbage. Amen. No man that warreth the warfare that we are warring gets tangled up in Washington, D.C. They used to have the Apostolic Congress that would go and they would try to get, I think Bush was the president at that time, and they would try to get him to do this and try to get him to do that. He was just as bad as the rest of them. He was. It's not going to make, just leave it alone. No man that warreth and tangleth himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Amen. Amen. Jesus you. called you. Mm -hmm. Jesus called you into his army. And you're walking for him. You're not walking for this world anymore. You're walking for God Almighty. You're, you're going to order your children right. And you're going to make sure. And you know what? People look at us like we're nuts for everything that we've yeah. done. And Amen. people think it's just crazy. I mean, the life we live in. But my kids are in church. Huh. Go figure well, you're nobody in this world. I think you're getting it. Yeah, there you go. Amen. You're right. I'm nobody in this world. I'm that crazy truck driver going down the road speaking in tongues listening to gospel music. Amen. That's who I am in this world. You can have it. Amen. I just like to get some of the people out of it and send them on to the kingdom. Yes. Amen. That's all. We're done. We're done. Amen. Jesus.